Everybody has people yeah. yes. get things underway. Maybe everybody can slide home before the, the wind starts. Late comers, is the wind picked up at all? It was pretty calm when I got it here an hour. So, no. Well, nice to see a group here tonight with the double whammy of COVID and this impending storm. We were getting calls throughout the week, I think. Folks wanted to come, but with the, that double whammy, it's nice that we pulled the group together. Um, and the Driftless Dialogue series, I see a few familiar faces, folks that routinely come. To me, I, I've been here as a presenter a few times, I've come to many of them, but when you live out in the hills, you can feel isolated from the the Hollywood and the culture and the Bright Lights Big City and all the amazing <laughs> things that are happening out there. And we plug in as best we can, but for me, sometimes months go by before I even get to lacrosse, right? But <laughs> through this series, we get to bring folks like Dr. Lattice right in amongst us and talk about great things. So in tonight's presentation, uh, Wisconsin Roots of Astronomy, is in line with the big initiative we've got. We're partnering in here on the Kitku Valley Reserve, and that's the establishment of an international dark sky park, whereby long term we hope to capitalize on uh, astronomical tourism and engage, and engage a lot more folks in the wonders of the night sky. So, all good things. So, Jim Lattice holds a PhD in history of science from UW Madison. And is the author of many publications in that field. He helped create UW Space Place, the outreach and public education center of the UW Madison Astronomy Department, and has directed it since its founding. He manages historic Washburn Observatory, which I just learned is not in Washburn. <laughs> <laughs> Teaches courses in introductory astronomy and its history, gives frequent public talks. <laughs> and consults widely for the media, including UW Communications, Wisconsin, and National Public Radio, and other national networks and newspapers. He's here tonight to explore with us again, Wisconsin Roots of Astronomy. So help me welcome Dr. Lattice. Well, um, thank you very much. It's, it's uh, so nice to be invited. Uh, to speak up here, and um, it's, it's one of my favorite topics. In fact, I'm working on two books on the history of the Washington Observatory and astronomy at, at uh, Wisconsin. Um, but I rarely have the honor of speaking to an audience that contains people who actually made a lot of that history, or you know who you are. Uh, and so uh, it's it's uh, it's really uh, great and, and a tad scary to to be. Uh, trying to act like an expert on, on some of this stuff. Unfortunately, I don't get to the stuff they know about until close to the end. <laughs> um, most, of the stuff is, most of the stuff is much earlier. I want to talk about why it is that, that, that in Wisconsin, um, we, have, uh, we have astronomers uh, and astronomy program and science that happens at Madison that are known worldwide. It's, uh, it's kind of interesting because the Origins of astronomy at Wisconsin were pretty modest. And the interesting question is how did that, how did a fairly modest operation in 19th century astronomy turn into an operation that was launching things into space as soon as that was possible? Um, to, to talk about the origins of the um, observatory, we really have to expand our context a little bit because it was part of the, 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 the observatory at the university, which eventually we named Washburn Observatory, is, uh, was created as part of what historians like to call the American Observatory Movement, which was um, a pretty substantial period of, from about the 1840s, right on up to the end of that century, a flurry of uh, founding of observatories. Communities were deciding they wanted observatories, and universities were deciding they wanted observatories, in part because astronomy was um, kind of like the, the, uh, the, the, the biotech movement of its day. These, these, uh, these days, if you want to be at the cutting edge of science, you're going to have genetic engineering, biotech labs, things like that. And astronomy kind of held that kind of status. 
in the 19th century, still does to, to a certain extent. Um, but the imagination that uh, astronomy uh, the, 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 uh, stimulated and the also connections to religious sensibilities in the United States um, caused a great deal of enthusiasm in various sorts of places. Um, this, uh, this slide here, for example, shows the early Harvard uh, Observatory, which was established in the mid-1840s. Uh, it was not the first one in the U.S., but it was typical of the observatories being founded. The, the uh, community of Cambridge decided that they needed an observatory because there was going to be a comet, and nobody in town knew how to uh, observe this comet, and maybe we ought to have an observatory. The community kind of brought it together. Uh, and got a telescope and built a building and kind of said to Harvard, well, you guys know about this stuff, don't you? Can't you run an observatory for us? This happens over and over again in American uh, communities. Chicago is another example. And it was happening in Wisconsin as well. Um, the earliest one I can find that I can find any details at all about, for example, uh, were at, uh, it is at uh, Milwaukee, the Milwaukee Downer College, which was a women's school established an observatory uh, in 1875. That's one of the earliest I can find in Wisconsin. So the movement had been going on quite a while, but remember where Wisconsin is, we're not on the East Coast where a lot of this stuff was happening. Uh, 1875 was early days in, uh, in Wisconsin. Um, there was another one uh, over on the river at Prairie du Chien, which was established about 1882 very small observatory by a Jesuit uh, mathematician priest named Johann Hagen, or John Hagen, he actually became a US and anglicized his, his name to John, John Hagen, uh, at this little college in Prairie du Chien. He built his own observatory there. And there are many connections there with, with Hagen and his observatory uh, to the Washington Observatory that I'm going to get to in a minute. Um, the uh, Hagen became quite famous and eventually was the moved back to Europe. He was from Austria moved back to Europe and became director of the Vatican Observatory. Another early one uh, is, uh, was at Appleton at Lawrence University, the Underwood Observatory. And um, uh, let's see, what else do we have? I have to think a couple more. Oh yeah, well, the one that still exists, although I don't think they use the observatory, the nice observatory going on the tower there as an observatory is at uh, Carthage uh, College in Kenosha. So observatories were popping up around Wisconsin on a smaller scale, just as they were doing around the, um, around the rest of the, of the country. Lots of uh, institutions wanting observatories. I'll just throw in another one that's getting kind of late. This is all past what was most historians would consider the observatory movement, but it's, it's one that we recently discovered uh, up at uh, UW Superior, which wasn't established until 1922, but they had this beautiful old telescope that is currently in storage, so you'd like to see them. Uh, like to see them restore that. So I want to include them in the observatory movement too. So if you know anybody at Superior, tell them they ought to fix up their old telescope. Uh, there's kind of an elephant in the room, which is one of the world's most prominent observatories. Yerkes Observatory is in Wisconsin as well. I usually don't count it as a Wisconsin observatory because it was built by the University of Chicago. Wisconsin was just a convenient place for them to close. Uh, but it actually is now <clears throat> a Wisconsin observatory because the University of Chicago has given it up. And it's been given to a foundation, a nonprofit in the um, community of Williams Bay, Wisconsin. So it actually is now a Wisconsin observatory. And uh, it's, a, it's a major uh, uh, edifice there with the world's largest refracting telescope in it. So there are observatories, most of which until I started looking into this, uh, I had never even heard of, scattered around Wisconsin, cropping up in the late 19th century. So Washburn Observatory fits right in the pattern, except in this case, uh, it was a former governor and the president of the university who cooked up the idea. It was not some community thing. Um, it followed more the pattern that say Yerkes did where there's somebody with a lot of money who says, what can we do that would have some impact? Impact maybe meaning different things to different people. What could be scientifically good? What could be useful to the university? What could keep my name prominent in the newspapers for a while? Um, in this case, 
The former governor was Cadwallader Washburn, and the university president was John Bascom of the uh, University of Wisconsin. And their interests came together in that Washburn wanted to make a major gift to the university, and Bascom wanted to see the University of Wisconsin uh, turn into a research institution, uh, which was a relatively new idea uh, in those days. Um, so they created an observatory, which Washburn paid for, and so it was named after, named after him, which was the University of Wisconsin's first research institution. It was really the first thing on that campus that was devoted to research. It's not to say research of sorts didn't happen at the university, but the observatory was the first institution devoted to research uh, founded at the University of Wisconsin. We don't talk a lot about the University of Wisconsin Madison being a major research university. And this was the beginning of that, the, of, of establishing the university as, uh, as such, uh, uh, as a research institution. Um, this is uh, uh, a, a view of it, uh, an, uh, an engraving. Um, that shows some details of it. I'm going to show you a photograph in a minute, so I'm not going to talk about the components of this um, just now. Uh, this is what it looks like today if you're out on Observatory Hill. Uh, and it's, it's so obviously it's still there, it's still intact. In fact, it's still in uh, regular operation. So I really want to say if you're in Madison on the first or third Wednesday of the month and the sky is clear, then the grad students in the astronomy department will open the observatory and it's open to the public and you can come up and look through the, the telescope uh, at whatever's in the sky that night whatever they uh, feel like pointing at um, i have to put a little asterisk there uh, that'll all happen as long as there's somebody to do it and the uh, some part of the observatory isn't broken which does happen from time to time but it's 140, <laughs> it's 140 years old so i gotta cut it a little bit slack but at most of the time first and third wednesday nights uh, you can come to Madison if the sky is clear and go up to Washburn Observatory. So this is this observatory, unlike a lot of those other ones, which have vanished completely. This observatory is still very much, uh, very much there. So um, the University of Wisconsin, from the very beginning, which was well before the observatory, because the University of uh, Wisconsin goes, goes back to about 1849, the Board of Regents said, if you're going to graduate from the University of Wisconsin, you got to take astronomy. Of course, that was one of the requirements from the, from the very beginning. There was no observatory until 1879. So we don't exactly know what they were doing. They might not have been looking for telescopes at all, or they might have had portable telescopes or something. Um, but it was, it, uh, it was a required, it was a required sub, uh, subject. Bascom, as I mentioned, was very much a booster of the concept called the research university, which in the US was a novelty at the time. In Germany, they, places like uh, Heidelberg and a few, few other universities were remaking themselves as research universities, right? in contrast to the traditional sort of the classical liberal arts university. The idea being that faculty members should actively engage in research and this would make them better teachers and would open opportunities for students. And it was copied in the US by um, Johns Hopkins and Harvard. And Bascom saw them as role models that the University of Wisconsin, which had already been around for 25 years, should become more like these research universities. And that was his interest in the observatory. Washburn, Ken Waller Washburn, uh, had made a, a large fortune in Wisconsin by um, through the industries of uh, lumbering and railroads and eventually milling, flour milling, and became vastly wealthy. Uh, and uh, funded a, a number of important um, projects uh, in, both, uh, uh, in, in both Minnesota and in Wisconsin. And uh, <clears throat> he wanted to make a major gift to the university. And actually his first idea was a library. Maybe I'll build a library for the university. It was Baskin who said, how about an observatory? Let's talk about an observatory. Again, Baskin was very much steeped in this observatory movement business and probably Washburn was uh, as well. Um, Washburn, uh, whenever he mentions the observatory, uh, talks about it as a gift to the state. So he didn't see it specifically as something for the university, but as something for the state, which makes it then the first of these institutions in Wisconsin to be seen as a state, at its identity as the state. All of these other things were much more 
well, all the other smaller observatories that I mentioned to you, except for the Rookies. Um, so Washburn, who had been governor, uh, lost his bid for re-election in 1874 and decided to devote himself to philanthropy and uh, um, was uh, still very influential in the legislature and saw to it that legislation was enacted in 1876 that said that the state will fund at the rate of $3,000 a year, um, an astronomy professor and will fund the operations of an observatory as soon as somebody, yet unnamed, donates an observatory to the state at no cost to the state. Well, Washburn had that legislation made specifically so that he could then step in and start writing the checks to build the observatory. So he gave this again as a gift to the as a gift to the state. Um, I won't go into Washburn's uh, background, but his influence in Wisconsin is evident. As I said, as you mentioned just earlier, there's all kinds of stuff named after Washington, from the far <laughs> north to, uh, to, the, to southern uh, Wisconsin. Um, just to give you an idea of how successful he was in, in, in business, the, his, his, eventually, his milling business was actually one of his later enterprises, the Washburn Crosby Milling Company. Um, uh, made a product, as you can see, they're painted on the side of the store in Wilton. It nicely kept up this store advertising. Here. They made a product called Gold Metal Flower in the 1920s, long after Washburn was gone. The Washburn Crosby Company bought up a few other local mills in the Twin Cities and called themselves General Mills. And that's that still, uh, of course, exists in every grocery store uh, in the country. You can find General Mills products, including the, the Gold Metal Flower. He was this. Like uh, everything he touched became enormously successful uh, business operations. So he could afford the observatory, which cost about $54,000 for him to build total, including the toll stick in uh, 1878, roughly. So by 1879, they needed uh, an astronomer. We've got an observatory now. And Washburn wanted uh, somebody who had an international reputation that he could bring to Wisconsin, and he chose and personally recruited, as far as we can tell, uh, the director of the University of Michigan Observatory, James Watson. Uh, Watson was internationally famous already uh, as the discoverer of the planet Vulcan. Perhaps you've heard of that. <laughs> uh, I don't know quite the mnemonics I know for the planets in the solar system, and it's not the one from Star Trek, which came a whole lot later. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, it, it's a fascinating episode in astronomy that, that astronomers had deduced that there probably was another planet closer to the sun than Mercury uh, in order to explain the irregularities in Mercury's orbit. And so many astronomers were searching for it and only a few found it, uh, including Watson. Um, it turned out he was mistaken. And so there is no such planet. Uh, and there was immediate controversy because he was looking and other astronomers were looking and he said, I found it. And others said, well, I'm looking, I didn't find it. So uh, the, in the midst of this controversy, Watson is hired to be the first director of Washburn Observatory where he was highly influential, but uh, didn't last very long. Um, uh, you can see it only says 1878 to 1880 there who died suddenly in the fall of 1880 and never lived to vindicate his discovery, but maybe that's just as well because it would have been disappointing for him <laughs> if, he, if he had. Um, the uh, observatory, though, that he and Washburn built, it was really between Watson and Washburn who shaped the observatory that we see in this uh, photograph from the summer of 1881. You see the main observatory building there. And uh, you can see that in the big dome, you can see the main telescope inside there, which was intended by Washburn to be a first class research telescope. There's, there's some hints that maybe he toyed with the idea of trying to get the biggest telescope in the world at the time. Telescopes have continued to get bigger. Uh, vastly bigger now. At the time that the Washington Observatory was built, the largest refracting telescope, which was the thing that research astronomers wanted, the largest <laughs> refracting telescope was at the U.S. Naval Observatory. It had a lens 26 inches in diameter. I shouldn't say had, it's still big, 26 inches in diameter. The next largest telescope in the U.S. at that time was actually in Chicago, at the old University of Chicago, with a uh, 
the lens 18 and a half inches in diameter. And the third largest telescope in the world was at Harvard University with a lens that has 15 inches in diameter. Sorry, not in the world, in the United States. Uh, Washburn specified that he wanted the, the telescope for his observatory to be equal to or superior to Harvard's. So, <clears throat> crassly interpreted, that means you got to have a telescope bigger than Harvard's, and our telescope is a 15 and a half inch telescope. So, <laughs> we, we outclass Harvard by, by one half inch. Um, it wasn't really that kind of thing. Probably people specified categories of telescopes in terms of other telescopes that already existed because each one was an individual. And so if you want to be as good or better than Harvard's, then that told the telescope maker, you've got to find some glass that's at least the size of Harvard's. And that would involve negotiating with companies in France and with the optical glass and all this kind of stuff. So it was really kind of a way of saying, we want to be in this category of observatory. We want to be taken as seriously as, as Harvard. But it did put us now third on the list of telescopes, pushing Harvard down to fourth. Uh, place. As you can see, though, there are some other things going on in the photo besides the main telescope. Off to the right is a smaller telescope that's in the foreground here, so it looks bigger. Uh, a small student observatory there, which James Watson built with his own funds. He built that out of his pocket uh, because he didn't want students fooling around with his serious telescope. So he could do student projects with the student observatory. And then he also, that is Watson, also planned to vindicate his discovery of the planet Vulcan. And so there's a special observatory that you can barely see in the picture. I don't know if I it uh, it's kind of hidden in the trees, but it's this little structure uh, right, over, right over here. Oh, okay, I'll still find it. That's the roof of it right over there. Something that he called a solar observatory, but it's sort of cloaked. Uh, it's kind of a stealthy uh, way of saying it's the telescope he wanted to use to look close to the sun in the daylight sky and find Vulcan. So he was going to vindicate his discovery of Vulcan that way. He built that observatory at his own expense, too. Uh, so the, uh, the, the early observatory was very much shaped uh, by uh, Watson. Here's a picture, a better picture now from the west side, and you can see the little solar observatory which was a very unusual instrument. This establishes a pattern of innovative instrument development that goes right on up to the present day. At Washburn, this instrument was specially designed to look through a tube buried in the hill. There'd be a mirror right up here, which could look into the sky on either side of the sun and a telescope in the basement here would look at the light coming down the tube. And he thought you'd be able to see the sky and see plants if there were any near the, in the vicinity of the sun. His authority for this was Aristotle. There were a lot of other astronomers who said this is nonsense. We don't really know why Watson took it very seriously, but he took it seriously enough to build a building and give it a try. It doesn't work. <laughs> but he didn't live long enough to try it, so again. Um, so uh, that observatory never really served any sort of scientific purpose once his successor actually did test the, the whole thing and found that the plan would not work. You see there in the background, I dated the photo before 1917. Perhaps you know that in 1917, there was a big fire in Maskham Hall that ruined the very nice cupola there, which was never rebuilt. So I don't really know the date of the photograph of this before that. So as I've said, you've got this traditional, very nice to the day, 19th century observatory. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the science that they did there. But historically speaking, the question is, how did we get a major modern astrophysics operation going here in Madison out of a little 19th century observatory? The early directors of the observatory, the early astronomers after Watson, uh, were very traditional astronomers. They were, um, as, as most astronomers were in, in the day, trained in what we usually call positional astronomy various sorts of position measurements on the on the sky the obvious sort of thing being maybe you want to make star atlases star charts um, there are reasons why astronomers are constantly remaking star charts constantly uh, it was happening even uh, back then so that's measuring positions on the sky but there are other sorts of position measurements that were important in the day uh, as well for example looking at double stars some of which, most of which are, are binary stars, are star systems, and you watch them and measure their positions very carefully and you can figure out how they're orbiting each other. 
and starts learning all kinds of stuff from that. Those are position measurements too. So positional astronomy. Oh, another example is measuring the distances the stars do something called parallax. It's all position measurements, and that's what the uh, early Washburn Observatory science uh, specialized. The, um, Edward Holden was uh, Watson's successor after he died suddenly. Washburn got on a train and went to the U.S. Naval Observatory to talk to Simon Newcomb, who was the director there, and asked, who can I get to be um, the next director of Washburn Observatory? And uh, Newcomb kind of looked around, and there was Edward Holden in the hallway, who was one of his assistants, and he said, well, how about him? And so they hired him. So Watson, uh, I mean, uh, Washburn brought him back to, uh, not literally brought him back on the train, but hired him. He came back, uh, he ended up just a couple of months later in Washburn as the second director of uh, Washburn Observatory. And um, Holden, there's a lot of stories about Holden too, which I uh, can't really go into. He was built at Washburn for a few years, enough to really finish the building. The building was literally unfinished. In fact, the, the solar observatory and the student observatory that Watson had started were also unfinished. There was a lot of finishing things up and getting them to actually working including acquiring another major research instrument, which was classical positional astronomy uh, specialized that would go in the observatory. And Holden took care of all of that kind of stuff and sort of left the observatory in a finished shape when he left to uh, take a job at the University of California where um, the, uh, the James Lick Trust, Lick was sort of California's washroom, Lick had left a lot of money and said, build the world's largest telescope with, with this money I'm leaving you. And, uh, and they started doing that. And by 1885, it was nearly finished. And they hired Holden to come out and become its director. Although it wasn't quite ready, so they made him president of the University of California, just sort of the whole placeholder for a couple of years <laughs> until they could finish the observatory, which time he was he became the observatory director, so they still joke at the University of California that the Lick Observatory Director Al Franks, the president of the, of the university. Um, that left a gap. You need somebody else now because Holden's only been around just a very few years and leaves. This is not much in the way of stability happening here. We lose Watson, we lose Holden. Comstock had come to Madison as from Ann Arbor as Watson's assistant, as a student's assistant. Um, so he was there and literally participated in the finishing of the observatory. Uh, and through a sort of a convoluted process that I won't go into, eventually was hired to be the director of Washburn Observatory. In the early days, the Board of Regents didn't quite trust him. He was really just a guy who would come as a student. None of these guys had PhDs, by the way. Uh, he was just this guy who knew knew the observatory really well. And so um, they made him junior to an astronomer at the Naval Observatory. Lots of Naval Observatory connections and lots of California connections too. Um, Asa Hall, who was world famous at the time as the, as the discoverer of the moons of Mars. Um, Asa Hall agreed to be a consulting director to spend some time with Comstock and try to make sure that things were happening as they should at Washburn Observatory. Um, and he served in that role for a couple of years, but uh, was, was very satisfied with the way Comstock was working. Comstock was the one who really formed a, 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 a coherent research program at Wisconsin, at Washburn, I should say, uh, at the Washburn Observatory. And um, he was the one, for example, I mentioned binary star measurements. He was the one who spent decades of his career measuring uh, binary stars by eye with an instrument called a micrometer on the end of the telescope. Uh, hundreds of double stars um, uh, providing data that other astronomers would then use to uh, come start at some of this too, to calculate the orbits of these things, which begins to give you physical information about the stars. <coughs> Um, he's also uh, responsible for the discovery of a class of stars. You don't see much about this. I, I hope in, in one of my books I will make a bigger point about this. He actually discovered red dwarf stars. What he really did was discover that stars come in classes, that not all stars are the same, that there are populations of stars 
And one population of stars are dramatically dimmer than most of the stars. And those are what we now call red dwarf stars, but he was able to infer the existence of this, uh, of this category of stars um, from positional measurements, from the positional measurements on the sky. Uh, he was able to, to make this, in effect, uh, discovery to make this uh, identification about the, one of the first real insights into stellar populations, what astronomers today call stellar populations. Well, that was classical positional astronomy, which makes a, uh, a very strong left turn into completely unexplored territory when Comstock retired. When Comstock retired, he recommended to the Board of Regents that they should hire this guy, Joel Stebbins, who at that time was director of the University of Illinois Observatory. Stebbins had actually studied with Comstock for a year. In fact, uh, Stebbins came to uh, Washburn Observatory in the academic year 1900-1901 um, after graduating as getting his undergraduate degree in mathematics at the University of Nebraska. And um, he studied with Comstock for a year. And Comstock said, you need to go to a place where they do serious astronomy training, go to Lick Observatory. And Stebbins got his PhD at Lick Observatory from the, from the University of California. Uh, and then after uh, some years, nearly 20, as director of the University of Illinois Observatory, um, Comstock picked him as his successor at Washburn. At Illinois, Stebbins started doing some nearly unique work. I'll say nearly unique because the work he was doing, he was the only one in the United States doing it. There were only two other astronomers in the world doing this work, and they were both from Germany. Uh, what he started doing was finding electronic ways to measure the brightness of light. Up until now, astronomers measured almost everything in astronomy by looking through the telescope with one kind of an instrument or another. Stebbins took away the eyepiece from the telescope here and started putting instruments there. So the light from the telescope goes in here. And there's a detector in there that produces a certain number of electrons if the star is bright enough. And there's a very delicate gadget down here called an electrometer. And the little indication on the electrometer will steadily look at a deflection there if the star is bright enough. And the eyepiece, the only eyepiece is there to look at the little thread in the electrometer. You don't get to see the star at all, but you see a deflection on the instrument. This is a characteristic of astrophysics. The astronomers don't get to look through the telescopes and the instruments get to look through the telescopes. But Stebbins was developing exactly that, that technique uh, in uh, starting around uh, 1912. And then developed the technology. I won't go into the technology development that happened at Illinois, but suffice it to say that by the time Stebbins moved to Wisconsin, by the time that Comstock encouraged him to come here, Stebbins um, had developed this to uh, a, a, quite a remarkable uh, degree and was able, for example, to use his instruments to see another kind of binary star system, one in which one star eclipses the other as they orbit around each other. And the light curve that you get from that shows the dips uh, in the combined light of the two stars as the one eclipses the other. And you can start deriving really interesting information about these star systems that way. Stebbins was doing this um, in a way that photography could not adequately do. You could do much more accurate measurements than people were trying to do this, something similar photographically. Um, so he brought this technology to um, Washburn Observatory. And it's right here that, as I said, there's kind of a left turn here because suddenly in the early 1920s, the University of Wisconsin, which had for 40 or 50 years, been uh, a, a very traditional positional astronomy observatory is now suddenly doing something, an astrophysics uh, um, uh, form of research that nobody else uh, in the world, certainly nobody else in the US can do. And, and Stebbins quickly outstripped the uh, guys in Germany, who, by the way, he knew and learned from uh, a good deal. It was not, they were not isolated operations um, at all. Well, uh, the, so the Washburn Observatory, within a very few years of 
I was seven there in 1922, um, very quickly became the US center of photometry. And we were about the only observatory that was producing um, uh, uh, photometry uh, results, especially on eclipsing variable stars uh, at, uh, at a high level, at a high level of accuracy, which the instruments were, were capable of. Uh, and um, Stebbins quickly found ways to extend this technology to address other scientific, uh, other astronomical uh, questions. And uh, be another, another talk, we we'll talk about how he did this, but things that started to um, provide, would begin to look like modern ideas of the size and structure of our galaxy, uh, for example, and also of the nature of external galaxies, which was highly debated in the 1920s, 30s. Um, so this, uh, this technology, which um, Washington Observatory became, the, by the way, nobody had, was at Urbana, even though Stephen left his instruments there at Urbana, uh, his successor did not take that out. Again, and Baker, Baker wasn't interested, uh, and um, uh, the only place that, that electronic photometry was being done was at, was at Washburn, following uh, Stebbins right there. So this is a really important point, and, and the development of astronomy at the University of Wisconsin, the strength in astrophysics and ultimately the, the, the strength in space astronomy comes out of this. If Stebbins hadn't come here, I don't know, the Washington Observatory probably would have kept on doing positional astronomy and would have faded away in about the 1930s and 40s, the way most of these other old observatories um, faded away as that kind of uh, work became irrelevant to modern astrophysics. Not because they don't need star positions, but because ways to other ways to do it, like photography and things like that, supplanted with really specialized instruments like micrometers, meridian circle telescopes. So um, Whitford, sorry, uh, Stebbins uh, was constantly seeking to improve his photometers, and he actively solicited um, participation by the physics department. <clears throat> He tried to interest people in the physics department in his work and succeeded in a few cases in hiring students to help him improve the photometers. And one of the improvements that seemed obvious was to, um, this is the 1920s, this is the age of radio. You put an antenna into the, out into the air and those very weak signals get amplified by electronic tubes. And you can hear it play it on a speaker, putting an amplifier on a photometer ought to be a way to see weaker stars. And Stebbins had a, uh, had a succession of uh, physics grad graduate students work on this problem, try to amplify the signal from the sensitive detectors hanging at the end of the, of the telescope. Uh, and none of them were successful until Albert Whitford in 1931, who succeeded in uh, creating an amplifier by taking a newly developed amplifier tube that had just come out from RCA called an electrometer tube and putting it in a vacuum tank and pumping out all the air and then it worked. Then you could amplify these very weak signals. Um, and this, uh, Stebbins, Stebbins liked to say it was like doubling the size of our telescope because the amplifier could detect stars so much dimmer than the unamplified versions. So suddenly, a whole new range of the universe was opened up, dimmer stars, more distant uh, objects. And as you like to say, it was much more cost effective to improve things at the small end of the telescope because it's way more expensive to build a bigger uh, telescope order than magnitude more expensive. So Whitford did that uh, and uh, continued as, um, as a, uh, effectively an assistant astronomer at, at Washburn instead of saw to it that he got hired he was the first expansion of astronomers at the university. There had just been two astronomers, two staff astronomers. Up till that time, Stebbins convinced the university to add a third faculty position so that he could keep Whitford there. And then Whitford was his successor. When, when Stebbins retired in 1948, he handpicked Whitford to be um, his uh, successor. Whitford kept up with the technology and uh, kept on uh, in both improving the, the methods that, that he had developed, but then other sorts of photometric instruments came along more commercially developed, things called photomultiplier tubes. Uh, and Washburn astronomers were some of the first ones in the world to use photomultiplier tubes because Stebbins also kept up good relations with RCA. Uh, he managed to talk them out of some photomultiplier tubes before World War II. These things are still prototyped 
things that so the Wisconsin astronomers were playing around with when it was long before it was the, uh, the late 40s before anybody else got photo of water tubes. Um, also, under Whitford's uh, leadership, a couple of other important things happened, uh, including that the observatory, which had been a private, not private, had been a, a, uh, its own uh, research institution, uh, became a department, was turned into an astronomy department, which made it easier for them to do things like offer classes and, and, and uh, give graduate instruction and things like that. And he also uh, established the Pine Bluff Observatory, the first new observatory that the university had since 1879, was established in 1958, the year that Whitford left to become the director of Lick Observatory, getting another Wisconsin Lick connection. Lots of others that I'm just skipping over. Um, it was this expertise in photoelectric astronomy, photoelectric photometry at Wisconsin that put the University of Wisconsin and the Washburn Observatory astronomers in just the right position when something came along, which was uh, the launch of Sputnik in October 1957 suddenly human beings are able to put stuff in orbit around the earth and the astronomers are immediately thinking about telescopes you put telescopes in orbit around the earth but there is a there's a little bit of a problem with putting your telescopes in orbit around the earth if you're doing astronomy like most astronomers are doing in 1957 which was putting photographic plates at the end of the telescope uh, because you can you can put a satellite in orbit that has those but how do you get the plates back down to earth take them to the drugstore to get developed. That's, that's hard. That's really hard. Um, astronomers were motivated to do this, though, strongly motivated to do this, because the light that reaches us from celestial sources is filtered by the Earth's atmosphere and prevents us from detecting large swaths of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. Um, so we see, the, we see visible light that will pass through the Earth's atmosphere on a clear day. Uh, but uh, we don't get to see really any substantial amount of the ultraviolet and infrared, for example, nor the X-rays and gamma rays. The radio does um, get make it to the Earth's surface, which is why that's the only other kind of observatory you find on the Earth's surface. You've got your optical observatories, and you've got your radio observatories. Uh, if you want to do infrared or ultraviolet, you've got to be above the Earth's atmosphere. But if your plates are in orbit, how do you get your photographic plates back? But if you have a photometer in orbit, you can, you can just transmit that signal back to Earth by radio. You can get your data back by radio. So photometry, Wisconsin photometers, are an easy thing, at least conceptually, to, uh, to think about putting into the space. Now, the newly formed NASA was very actively looking for projects that they could make into scientific satellites that they could launch into space. Um, and um, the uh, one of the one uh, uh, um, astronomer who was extremely interested in this idea was Arthur Code, who had actually been at Washburn on the Washburn staff for a few years in the early 1950s before he was hired away to Caltech. But then when uh, Whitford uh, moved to Lick in 1958, the um, the post, of course, of the director is open, and Art Code wanted to come back to Wisconsin because, in part, the astronomers at Caltech, at Caltech, they had the largest optical telescope in the world by that time. They had the 200 inch telescope at Mount Palomar, and they operated some other ground based telescopes. They were actually not too interested in space astronomy out there in California. But Art was a visionary who wanted to see these things put into space. And he talked to the University of Wisconsin and said, I want to come back because I want to move in this direction of building space-based instruments. And they bought it. Apparently, it sounded pretty good to people at the university. And so that worked out. Um, Art's uh, proposal in these early days that NASA was soliciting ideas for what to put in space, um, Art's proposal for a space-based satellite was something that would weigh about 100 pounds, which is actually a constraint imposed by NASA. What could you do if we could put 100 pounds of orbit for you? 
All right, so well, for 100 pounds, we can put uh, like a roughly eight inch telescope with a Wisconsin photometer on it. And you can put that in orbit and it'll be really cheap. And if it doesn't work, well, that's okay too. It'll be really cheap, but it'll be easy to build, it'll be small. Um, the problem though of putting astronomical instruments into orbit um, took a different path from Art's original 100 pound satellite because NASA recognized, not directionally, <coughs> that they were going to be putting a lot of things in space and they needed satellites that had sort of certain commonalities about them, like all your instruments are going to need electricity, your instruments are going to need thermal controls, your instruments are going to need to be pointed in certain directions. So these are going to be common to anything we put up there. So we should just have a, a generic spacecraft. And then our code can make us a photometer that we can plug into it. And that model became what's called the Orbiting Astronomical Observatory, or the OA series of satellites. And uh, the University of Wisconsin uh, was going to build one of these instruments. Our code formed an organization at Wisconsin separate from the astronomy department, well, connected, but not part of the astronomy department per se, called the Space Astronomy Laboratory, which then built um, the uh, what's called the Wisconsin Experiment Package, this one over here. If you come to Space Place in Madison, you can see one of the ground-based engineering models for it. The original still in orbit. The, the, the satellite is still orbiting up there. Um, the OIO-1 was the total failure, by the way, so that's why this is OIO-2. Uh, not our fault. Uh, Art like to say that the instrument on the OIO-1 was, com was commanded to stay off and it did. <laughs> it just stayed off. And then the telescope destroyed its I mean, the satellite destroyed itself. Uh, NASA said build another one. So a second Wisconsin experiment package flew on the OAO 2, which was launched uh, and became a very successful scientific satellite. Lots of important scientific results come, as Art would say, when you start looking where somebody has a look, like the ultraviolet sky, you're going to find something new. And it did. Not going to go into the scientific results of. Uh, of, of OAO. But another really important thing that OAO did was show that you could effectively operate a space based observatory from the ground. And we do that all the time now, right? The OAO was the first such facility operated successfully in space by uh, Wisconsin astronomers toiling away at Goddard Space Flight um, Center long before there was adequate software for doing all sorts of planning. There was an awful lot of sweat and uh, uh, late nights that they had to put in in order to figure out how you operate a, an instrument in orbit. But it was all uh, beneficial when NASA's plans continued to um, develop and the Hubble Space Telescope was, was in planning. The Hubble Space Telescope was going to carry a suite of uh, instruments, and one of them would be a package of photometers from the UW Space Astronomy Lab. And in fact, it was. Um, this is a cutaway. You can, you can see those little yellow boxes here. Well, they're not very little. These, these sorts of boxes here. This is where the science instruments are in the Hubble Space Telescope, and uh, our instrument fit in one of those one of those spots. The uh, it's called the high speed photometer, and it was going to take advantage of its unique position in orbit. That's sort of the phone booth side. Give you a rough idea of the size of the science instrument that's set up there for testing out of Goddard. That's not one of the that's not how it looks at the telescope or anything. Um, and uh, one of the uh, engineers on the project that posed it. The, the high speed photometer was um, flown successfully on the Hubble, but the Hubble itself was not so successful. Maybe you remember back in those days, the, the Hubble telescope did not operate as advertised uh, at first. We saw lots of pictures of fuzzy images. Those fuzzy images were very bad for the high speed photometer, which expected to have probably focus images. Also, expected them that they were pointing in space. They expected to be pointed stably in space as well, and the Hubble wasn't delivering that either. Um, so, the, the kind of sad ending for the high speed photometer, NASA had settled on a plan to correct these problems, but the correction involved taking out our instrument and putting in. A, a new package of optics that would correct the images. So the high-speed photometer, as wonderful as it would have been, uh, operated for uh, 
uh, under under straightened circumstances did some science but didn't get to carry out the mission but not its fault the high speed photographer by the way is currently at space place too on exhibit you can come see that it's in madison as well another major product uh, project sorry at this time was another space-based instrument called the uh, wisconsin ultraviolet photopolarimeter experiment this one right here called whoopee and uh, what was another way to exploit the possibilities of measuring ultraviolet light uh, in orbit by looking at the polarization of ultraviolet, <laughs> of ultraviolet light. That's, you saw an earlier picture of our code. That's, that's, that's our code. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have time to go into what the, uh, except to, to say that one, one sort of exciting part, at least for those of us who were involved in it in those days, was kind of exciting for one of the astronomers was going to fly on one of those shuttle missions. Uh, that would be this guy, Ken Nordseek. Uh, and uh, so Ken went all, through all the astronaut training. In the end, the whole deck got reshuffled by the Challenger accident in January of 2006. And so life goes on. But uh, but Ken actually did fly. Whoopi did fly on, on two successful missions uh, on the aboard the space shuttle. I'm leaving out a whole huge chapter of space instruments. Well, I'm not leaving them out because I'm putting them up here, but I'm not talking in any detail about them because putting things in orbit is not the only way to have a space-based instrument. Another way to do it is to launch smaller rockets that can't get into orbit, but they can go up really high. They can go into space above the Earth's atmosphere, and then they're not going fast enough to go into orbit. They fall back down again. But for a few minutes, you can do some good work. Uh, out there in space. And those suborbital rocket missions were carried out from really the earliest days of the Space Astronomy Lab. NASA funded those as preparation for the OAO. Uh, but they turned out to be scientifically very useful, went through a number of phases of development, different types of uh, rockets, and certainly the sophistication of the instruments and their missions uh, changed a, a great deal. Um, there's one of the more modern sorts of sorts of rockets that we uh, that, the, that the lab uh, has launched uh, many times. And these have also, I did not put this in specifically because I knew you were going to be here. Today. This is already <laughs> in the talk. Uh, the, um, uh, this is, there's a lot of technological development that has to go into all of this uh, sort of thing. And so there are things you become good at and know how to do better. And one of the things that came out of the lab was a better way to point these payloads when they're around. Uh, space. So uh, a gadget called the Star Tracker 5000 was, was developed at Space Astronomy Lab to carry out that task better than the instruments that that, um, that was standard equipment for NASA uh, at the time. It's not the only sort of thing, but it's a nice example of the kind of technical problems that you have to solve, which then sometimes turn into things that are useful in their own, uh, in, or, or I should say more broadly useful than just the problem that you set up. So you might think by now that all Wisconsin did was launch things into space, but actually things have changed a lot in, in recent years because um, funding patterns at NASA and other organizations that fund that kind of thing have changed a good deal. And uh, NASA doesn't fund as much of the way, for example, of those small suborbital rocket experiments anymore. Uh, so we're not launching those as far as I know. From, from Wisconsin anywhere. But I've left over, left out now ground-based astronomy. So we'll just come out in the last couple of minutes here, just turn around and come back. Wisconsin does still have telescopes on Earth. The Washburn telescope is on Earth, but it's not a research telescope anymore. It's too way too old. But we do have research telescopes, for example, uh, a major research telescope at uh, out at Kitt Peak. Uh, called the the wind. You can see the partners there. These big telescopes are control consortium uh, uh, projects. Oh, this is a little out of order. Another one, even bigger, is in South Africa, and uh, building the instruments uh, for this major telescope have been a big part of what's been going on in Wisconsin. And this is this is actually an example of the kind of thing I meant to, to talk about before. Solving some of these technical problems can lead to new kinds of instruments. This is a uh, almost a collaboration of the astronomy and the physics department, almost literally called the Wisconsin H Alpha Mapper, which was a space astronomy lab project that operated ground based, but using a, a type of spectrometer uh, spectroscope technology that um, 
was a is a, is a Wisconsin specialty. Well, uh, oh, and here's okay. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, one of those major instruments being built for that South African telescope, the Salt Telescope. This is a piece that's already down there and it's sold on the telescope, but there's a, there's a more more of it uh, still under construction and being uh, sent off uh, next year, I think. Uh, let's. Uh, I'm going to get to the end here. If I'd been giving this talk a month or two ago, I wouldn't. I would not have ended. Uh, wrapped up my talk this way, but the Space Astronomy Lab, uh, which I've talked about a good bit here, as this consequence of the development of astronomy at the University of Wisconsin and the astrophysical technology at the University of Wisconsin. Um, the space, which is not only space-based stuff, though, but has been ground-based stuff as well, like LAM. Uh, the Space Astronomy Lab was um, transformed in about 2013 when another organization called the Washburn Astronomical Laboratories was formed, and Space Astronomy Lab, well, it was never actually clear to me what the relationship was of those two organizations exactly, but just a little bit earlier, a couple of months ago, uh, and yet another reorganization of the Space Astronomy Laboratory was formally declared closed. So I can put 1959 there to, to 2021. But a lot of the work, a lot of that kind of work is still going on at the Washburn Astronomical Labs, which is now what you'll see on the website, for example, um, if you go there, uh, doing uh, similar sorts of instrument development. But the whole flavor of it has shifted over the last 20 years or so for a number of different reasons, partly funding patterns, as I mentioned, at the, at the federal level, the kinds of things that NASA wants to fund. We have a big example about to get launched very soon now, the James Webb Space Telescope you've probably heard about. It was a hugely expensive thing that was um, sucked out of the, a lot of the energy out of the kinds of projects that the Space Astronomy Lab might have been doing if it had not become such a dominant part of the NASA science uh, budget. But it's, that's just an example. The, the patterns run that way towards bigger, uh, more centralized projects. Um, also, it took people like our code, he's far from the only one on the list, it took people like our code to say, this is the kind of science that we want to do. And things have changed also in the UW Astronomy Department in other research directions without quite as much emphasis uh, as putting a modeling on uh, space-based research. So there's been a big complexion change and rebranding and a literal end to the Space Astronomy Lab just in the, in the uh, recent uh, and very recent uh, past. So I'll wrap up with that though, uh, even if that's maybe kind of a sad note and it is for some of us, but on the other hand, um, it's, it's a product of a wonderful history and looking at the history, I find uh, looking at the history of astronomy in general, fascinating and to see how the University of Wisconsin has been a part of that and has shaped that uh, is, is, um, it, it is, a, is a remarkable thing. That's largely, I think, underappreciated by um, people who live in Wisconsin, but also people outside of Wisconsin. The, the, the history of, of uh, Wisconsin astronomy is really uh, yet, to be, yet to be written. And I hope we'll remain on, on the frontiers of science, even though we're no longer on the frontiers of the, of the geogra geographical frontiers of the country the way we were in 1878. So I will stop there, and thank you uh, very much for your, for your patience and attention. A little longer than I, than I meant to. I was going to try to leave a little bit of time for questions, but I guess we're okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, right at the end, you mentioned the current faculty have research interests that have taken their focus away from the space base. What, what sort of research is? Well, there? so there, there are some new kinds of research that couldn't even have been done <clears throat> years ago. Uh, for example, one, one uh, major um, theme these days, and the Wisconsin faculty reflect this to a good degree, is, is uh, simulation of, of systems. Why does a galaxy look the way it looks? Well, it looks that way because 
of the gravitational interactions of all the parts that make it up, which is billions of parts. Uh, the calculations to do that, to do simulations of gravitational interactions of something like the parts of the galaxy, the stars in the galaxy, it is, is actually now becoming possible with computers that can calculate million heart, um, uh, you know, the, the interactions of the million stars in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and so new research areas have come along that don't involve space-based space -based research and the Wisconsin, uh, to, to some extent, the Wisconsin faculty reflects these sorts of new things. Another, another big area is exoplanet science. Um, and the department is moving in, in directions. The, the, the people, a lot of the recent hires have been in the areas of investigating, finding exoplanets and understanding the nature of exoplanets and thinking about uh, re researching the um, what kinds of planets you might have about what kind around what kinds of stars things like that. Now, space-based research is applicable to that. And for example, the, the web telescope will be extremely useful for that kind of work, but it doesn't involve any funding coming to the space astronomy lab um, to do that. So there are directions of research. It's, it's not to say that there, there's uh, no possibilities for space-based research, but the direction among the astronomers at Madison had been away from the space based sorts of things. Doesn't mean it couldn't turn around. But you still have the problem that NASA would have to decide that they want to start funding, for example, more suborbital rocket experiments as well. So these two things may, you know, they're probably linked at a certain level. Um, maybe not maybe not at the level of explicit policy in terms of the research ideas that people are thinking that they want to emphasize in the big department. Well if you don't see a lot of future for rocket based science instruments, then maybe that's going to affect your decision about research and hiring and things like that. They didn't launch the rockets off campus. Let's say again, the rockets, those uh, suborbital rockets. Did they launch them from campus? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> where did they, where, where, how yeah, good question. Um, I didn't say that, did I? Those suborbital rockets are launched. <laughs> Uh, that was kind of a sound like your sweatshirt here. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was trying to be a joke. Okay. Uh, New Mexico. New Mexico. New Mexico. So New Mexico, they used to launch at Wallops. They do sometimes. Yeah, so Wallops Island, NASA launches small rockets from Wallops Island out to Virginia and White Sands Missile Range. Those are the only two I know of. They probably do it. So you can go out to the Pacific to launch a rocket or something. They've launched. Uh, they launched few from the Marshall Islands. Marshall. They needed to launch closer to the equator to see some southern targets. They also launched rockets from Poker Flat Research Range, which is north of Fairbanks, Alaska. And that in the middle of January when it's nice and dark, and it's also nice. <laughs> so so yeah, there are dedicated places where NASA launches those things. So so NASA is launching them. Yes. Okay, it's not necessarily the university doing it. There's not a grad student pushing the button. Well, there's a lot of grad students pushing buttons. Uh, yeah. but, but no, NASA is responsible for, for actually carrying out the launch. But there's um, a lot of great examples of, of the stuff that goes right from Madison and the people right from Madison out there. The people from Madison are bolting these things onto the telescopes and Getting them up to speed, checking them out, and saying, okay, let's launch this thing. So there's a huge involvement there at that level, which is great for training students, for example, that doesn't happen if it's a, if it's an all NASA thing like Hubble Space Telescope. You hand that off at a certain point, and then those kinds of people are in the background. But um, I say, yeah, much more close involvement. And that really answered the question there when you said they just get it to a certain point and they say, put this in space. Right. So the NASA takes over. If it's right, if it's yeah. the, some of those other sorts of things, but the uh, that, that's why the character of the suborbital rocketry is, is is really different because of the much more, much more uh, intimate involvement. If you go to the Space Place um, YouTube channel, there's a very nice documentary called Astronomy from the Edge of Space, which is about profiles a uh, uh, a um, 
a rocket, a suborbital rocket uh, payload and, uh, and a launch, and you get a really nice look at, at how that uh, works. And, and about, I mean, I'm sure it's all loaded up. How long does it take to, from the conception to getting something into space? Uh, you know, whatever they decide to put up the rocket, and then um, what's the cost? I think I'm going to ask my <laughs> and I, I don't friend mean, like many years, Jeff numbers. Percival. <laughs> uh, so astronomer Jeff Percival here has, has been involved in this business for a real long time, and I'm just going to let him answer that those questions. The way, the way it usually works is uh, a university astronomer has an idea for something to do in space in a mission like take 15 minutes of observing in space. They put together a team of grad students, they propose to NASA, and they get a grant. And the grant might be for, I don't know, one or two million dollars for three years or something. And they get some time to build the rocket, deliver it, fly it, analyze the data, publish it, and out comes a new PhD. And that sort of is a sort of a life cycle thing where they pick the grad students to get their PhDs. That's where you get the scientists who propose bigger things, right? You know, the people who propose the Hubble and, uh, and Pluto probes and things that go to Jupiter. All those people came out of the rocket program at some point in their early careers. And that's where they learn to do that stuff. And so NASA, through the decades, they gave the rocket program a sort of pipeline to produce scientists who know how to do space astronomy. Before they unleash them on these these ten billion dollar uh, telescope projects, <laughs> so it's like it's a, it's it's like maybe three years start to finish, and it's a million or two dollars. I mean, that's very rough. Yeah. And oftentimes they'll fly the same payload. They get payload back. They go back to the university. A couple of new grad students, graduate students just starting, get involved. They treat the instrument in some way, change you know behavior, fly it again. Wisconsin flew one paper five times with a different generation of grad students each time. Um, thanks. I'm curious how, <clears throat> how when you're observing the sky or the universe, how often uh, in your life have you come across things that you just don't know what they are or that feel Huh. Or, or maybe you never found out, <clears throat> and how often does that happen for other um, astronomers? Well, so there's all, I mean, professional astronomers take images of things or, or find the aspects of things, like a, a spectrum or something like that, that just leave the spectrum, spectrum, spectrum ahead. And, and, um, and these become interesting problems in, in science. It's just a really bright thing really far away, or it's a really hip thing really nearby. Solar system is exploding, is it collapsing? So that happens all the time. If you're asking me whether out looking at the sky, I have seen things flying around in the sky that I can't identify, I can pretty probably say that's never happened. Uh, and I don't know any astronomers for whom that's happened. I take phone calls all the time. Mm -hmm. Or phone calls or emails uh, from people that I'm saying, you know, there's this this is great thing outside there, and I don't know what that I don't know what that is. And um, usually, when we get good reports, we can tell them what it is. Yeah. The, the number of unexplained phenomena uh, is really really low, um, unless you're looking at the results of instruments. So instruments can produce all kinds of stuff that people don't know where it's coming from. But the things that people see in the sky, we can usually identify. And if we can't, there's usually a strong suspicion that the report we got is just not consistent with. Um, and I, I've had people uh, report that Jupiter flew from east to west in two hours. Uh, well, it turned out to be Jupiter, but their estimate of how long it was in the sky was wrong. So there's, I couldn't do anything with a solution like that. I told the guy he emailed me a picture, a picture of um, So, but he'd given me a report that it was impossible to reconcile with, with anything. So those kind of things happen all the time, that there are unexplainable things, but I think the lack of explanation is generally in the facts, in the observations that you're handed to try and interpret. 
Right. Yeah. That's, that's my experience. Yeah. Yeah. I was really curious about that being uh, an astronomer and what <clears throat> what that whole like study feels like as far as exciting and like unknown. Yeah. Well, just to make be clear on that, I'm not really an astronomer. I'm a historian of astronomy, but I do oh. spend a lot of time doing star right up them here at Big Earth. Uh, setting up telescopes and, and showing uh, people the sky and, and doing programs and parts and things like that. Um, so I have spent a little bit of time looking at the looking at the sky, and we see a lot of satellites, and we see a lot of meteors, and we see plenty of planets and moons of planets and, and all kinds of wonderful, uh, wonderful, wonderful things. But it hasn't happened to me yet. I've seen some things that kept me guessing for a little while, but nothing that once I the most mysterious thing I ever saw was quite a few years ago uh, when I saw what looked like satellite, except there were, I suddenly realized there were three of them marching across the sky in a constellation. But what I'll call a constellation, what's not called a constellation of satellite. I didn't know that such things, it turns out the Air Force used to fly all the time, probably still does. Um, but uh, these arrays of satellites that fly in formation, I had never heard of it. And so it took me a while. To figure out that that's what I had seen, but for for a while, for a couple of days, so I started asking around. I couldn't explain that, that observation. But usually, so I'm not saying that I instantly know what everything is in the sky, but I've never had the experience that with a little bit of digging, I couldn't figure out what was going on. And what were you, as far as that was the best resource for um, common folk who do observe something and they just they don't know like how to really look into it. Well, yeah, so that can, that can be hard depending on what the, what the nature of it is. Um, but these days, there are some really wonderful resources on the web and some things that are great that you can install on your computer. The place to start, um, probably, that there's a number of possible approaches, but there's a nice free program called Stellarium, which you can install on a computer. Um, and you can install databases of objects and satellites and, and things like that. So if you were outside and you see something weird flying over, you can go and explore it. You got very differences and you can set the time back and run it through that time over outside, and you'll see that satellite across the sky. You've got to be real careful to notice the time and notice how high above the horizon and what direction. You've got to have enough enough hard data to then go back and cover it. But that's a really good tool, and, and that this all makes about that I saw this really super bright thing, whatever. And I can find out depending on how much information I have about the star that I'm looking at, for example. So that's fine. Um, when uh, another thing that's good for satellites, and an awful lot of the things we see now are right satellites and more of them today, there's a website called Heavens Above. It's actually heavens above.com. And Heavens Above lets you do uh, uh, similar sorts of things. It's not graphically as interesting as Solarium. Solarium is great for star games. I highly recommend it. Um, um, Heavens Above will do something uh, similar for you, but in more detail and give you a lot more information about what things are up there in the sky, concentrating almost entirely on the satellites uh, in that case. Um, oh, yeah, Solarium, you can go and just click on things and it'll light up stuff for you. So those are two really good, really good tools. Um, the uh, shoot, what's it called? The international. If you Google for international meteor organization, you'll get their website. I don't think it's IMO.org, it's something like that. Um, they will they they collect and then um, uh, provide reports on bright, uh, extremely bright meteors, things that are called you know, fireballs or things like that. Uh, and um, sometimes those are natural, and sometimes they are re entering satellites, for example, that, that can look like a very bright meteor, basically are a little bit. Um, and the IMO maintains a directory of those sorts of things. So if you think you saw something like that early in the morning, you can go check the IMO. Probably you're not the only one, or, or you can make a report if you do see a little bit of And then um, they will correlate. Reports from people, you know, multiple observers seeing the trail of one of these things, then you can go back and figure out how high it was and how fast it was moving, interesting stuff like that. 
So there are a number of uh, those sorts of things that are common things that we see in the sky. But otherwise, that, other sites that one see might include things like the Aurora Borealis, for example, things like that. And if you didn't know what was going on there, um, you probably you might be puzzled for a little while. Yeah. About those sorts of things too. But then, then maybe you're getting to the point where you have to email them and I'll, I'll see if I can do the sort of that. Yeah. So some of you said, Made me a little sad. And it's you described this transition from direct observation through land or space based telescopes to modeling systems inside a computer environment. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes. And it made me a little sad because uh, I'm an ecologist, and that's the way that field has gone. You know, the, the pioneering days of guys like Eldo Leopold out in the wilds, you know, measuring things and learning. And, Provide all this cool information that I think excited the public. And nowadays, ecologists model populations and communities, and the results go into professional journals, but they don't tend to excite the public. Is, is there a danger that all these great and exciting things that have happened, like discovering planets and the Hubble telescope and manned spaceflight, and all these things that the public really gravitated toward? That connection is going to be lost a bit as the focus turns inward. Well, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to say that all of astronomy was going in you know, that direction. Certainly, this, this, this population of astronomers, like most in the world, sitting around with bated breath waiting to see what's going to happen with the web. And it's going to, if everything works with that, it's going to see things that nobody has ever seen before. And that's, you know, that's not going to be simulations or something that's going to be galaxies that are just fresh out of the big bang and stuff like that there's great stuff there's great stuff going on uh and um yeah the simulation stuff sounds a little dry although it produces great animations you see, <laughs> you see really great really great uh simulations of formations and collisions of galaxies and things like that which then look remarkably like things that we see out there in the sky when you see these strange configurations how did that get there well, the simulations can give us some insight uh, into that. So um, that, I just tossed that out as something that's feasible now with computing power that's becoming available that just was, you know, couldn't be done at the level that it could be done now. So it becomes trendy. That almost seems to trivialize it. I don't need to say that it's just a fashion, not just a fad, um, but it's becoming, it's becoming a, a, an emphasis that just wasn't there uh, for a previous generation of, of astronomers. Um, now these things all have their all have their place, and the the web will be looking you up. Um, the web will be showing us stuff uh, that then the, the simulators will be trying to trying to model, trying to understand what we're seeing out here. So it, it should all it should all work to it should all work together. Well, thank you again. That was fantastic. You're welcome. Up or your dark skies. Yeah. Here, so yeah. Like, uh, Sorry, you lost the fire. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess you did you get called out. Did you get call? Yeah. Was well, that where we had to go? Are you heading back to Madison yet this evening? Uh, no, we are going to go to Kathy's home. We're going to stay at her place yeah. tonight. I want to introduce you to someone if I can. But, uh, Dr. Jefferson. Uh, I heard you were working on a small